Good morning, everybody. We have two more chapters in this class and we are going to be done. So the first chapter of the two is going to be the stars and the galaxies. And the last chapter has to do basically with the structure of the universe, overall space time and relativity and things like that. Uh, I just want to bring your attention to the fact of where we started from about three months ago or less actually, or uh, toward the end of August. We started with uh, uh, with basic laws. We asked questions about what does basically physical science entails as to what do we do when I mean, we study motion and things like that. We came up with three laws of Newton. And then we went through a journey to a point today where we're going to study the entire universe. So it's been a really a big journey. And this is honestly one of the most fun classes I have. Usually when I teach this class, I really enjoy it more than those basically math intensive stuff. I mean, it's fun on their own uh, status, but this one actually you can do you can do a lot more with it, and you get to explore so many things. I was just showing you guys my telescope in here, and I'm hoping that you guys will be excited enough. So hopefully you can get your own, or at least seek to see see where you can get stuff like this one and be excited about it. In terms of testing, we really have only two more tests. Uh, this discussion today is going to be graded. The next one is not going to be graded because it's going to put us right with the uh, within the uh, exam uh, period. There will be a review exam for the exam uh, for uh, exam three. This uh, it should be published by uh, uh, Thursday. We should have it available for you guys. And then uh, the exam three will be due by ten o'clock on uh, Tuesday. So there will be no class next Tuesday. And then immediately after that, there will be available for the final review, which is actually, I made a mistake earlier when I said that somehow I'm going to drop the final. No, the final is graded separately, so you must really take it. So there will be the review that is going to be open actually for the final starting all actually from uh, this weekend too, but it's going to stop at 10 o'clock at night on uh, Monday. So you cannot do the review anymore because you're going to be focused doing the, uh, the, uh, the exam. And then the review will open again uh, just after the exam uh, three is basically end, ends. And uh, until uh, uh, again, Wednesday uh, before the uh, actual final uh, may, uh, is available for you guys, the final is going to be due again at 10 o'clock on uh, Thursday. So that's all of the, in terms of everything in terms of the uh, business stuff and things like that. The next class, there will be discussion sessions. So you always are welcome to do discussions and ask questions, but uh, it's not gonna be graded. So that's the only difference in terms of uh, what's going on. So chapter, I don't forget the numbers, but I know it has to do with stars and galaxies. So let's get to it. That's not it. Did I close the file? Can't find it there. Hold on. Let me stop share. Let me start sharing again. File. Yeah, here it is. Okay. So again, uh, we're going to be talking about stars and galaxies. This is outside of our solar system. The last chapter we talked about was the solar system, namely the fact that the sun is uh, the main component of the solar system. Ninety-nine percent of the uh, mass of the uh, solar system is actually in the sun. Then you have the four major planets, and uh, divided into two groups. First of all, the so-called uh, uh, terrestrial planets or the inner planets and the inner planets include of course uh, mercury venus earth and uh, mars and then you have the outer giants basically the gas giants two gas giants actually to be more specific namely uh, saturn and uh, and uh, jupiter but the others also they have the, they are actually gas and mainly icy structures underneath, uh, especially because they are far away, and namely Neptune, uh, Neptune and uh, Uranus. And then you also have uh, dwarf planets. Dwarf planets turn out to be a lot of them, including uh, Pluto. And also, of course, we have other uh, components in the solar system, namely uh, comets and asteroids. Those are basically the remnants of uh, what uh, formed in the beginning of the solar system. That is, in a nutshell, what the solar system is. This is basically the mechanics of it is really uh, following uh, no more than F equals to MA, the basic laws of Newton. Okay, so and it was well described and we understood a lot of them. We're still exploring uh, a lot more, so we don't know. We, we know very little compared to what we know. I mean, uh, we know very little compared to what we don't know, I should say. 
So this is the solar system. Today, we're going to go slightly beyond that. Namely, we're going to start exploring the stars. In terms of the stars, the nearest star is actually called the Proxima Centauri, and it's about 4.0 light years away. So 4.2 light years away. So this is a very, 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 very far object, but this is our closest neighbor, okay? Proxima uh, Centauri, at least, system is made up of three stars. There is the uh, A, uh, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. Those are basically binary system. And with them comes the uh, Proxima Centauri, actually it's uh, three stars uh, within uh, the, the same neighborhood. The, prox uh, the pro Proxima is closest to us and it's actually a small star and it's uh, red. We don't see it with the naked eye. You really have to have powerful equipment to see it. But the other two stars are actually big. I mean, especially Alpha Centauri is slightly bigger than the Sun, and uh, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B is slightly less than the Sun, and that's basically our immediate neighbors. But we're going to go beyond that. We're going to go way beyond that. So this is not the system that we're going to be talking about. So again, we're going to be looking at the night sky. So when you look at the night sky, I have, let me turn on the software. I have it actually running. And that's basically when you go out, you're going to see objects in the sky. And people were amazed in the beginning by those uh, basically uh, what looks like patterns. And they gave them names, namely constellations. And the names of the constellation is a reflection actually of the cult culture that named them. So each culture has its own names for them. And they really don't mean much in terms of the structure of the, so of the, uh, of the sky. So basically what you look at and you see that geometry in there and some of them uh, uh, basically associated it with uh, with uh, with mythology and other things that have to do very little with science or nothing at all with science but a lot of has to reflect the culture that basically uh, was observing those things but then we have other objects actually that we can start to identify after examining them and seeing the stars that they're first of all uh, more or less the same as our sun. Some of them are a lot bigger than the sun and they are few. And uh, some of them are a lot smaller than the sun and they are the most, okay? Most of the stars are actually the type of Proxima Centauri, uh, the one that I mentioned in the beginning. So that's really uh, stars mainly are small, okay? And then you have objects in the sky that are not really typical stars, namely like neutron stars, like uh, uh, black uh, black holes, which is another structural part of the, uh, the sky. But that's just in our neighborhood. So when you say, for example, something around a thousand light years away from us, or even 20,000 light years from us, you're looking at things in our own galaxy. When you say something is 100, year, 100 light years from here, light year is a big distance if you want to really compare to meters or kilometers. So uh, <clears throat> you're looking at objects in our own galaxy. When you're talking millions or hundreds of thousands or millions or even billions of uh, light years from here, you're talking of galaxies, namely islands of their own with their own uh, stars and their stars could uh, be at, at least in those neighborhoods too. So this is in a nutshell what we're ta talking about. So. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, <coughs> brightness of stars because that's one of the indicators of its temperature. <coughs> when you look at star, and if somehow you can uh, estimate its distance or uh, uh, you can find basically its own intrinsic luminosity, there is an intrinsic law of how bright an object and depending on how far it is. So once you find its luminosity, you know its temperature. Once you have that indication about its temperature, and you can actually estimate its size too. So once you know its size, you can do a lot more than that. You can actually uh, determine uh, how far, how big, it, how old it is, how small it is, because you know the element that it's, uh, it's, it's burning has to be here hydrogen if it's really in the main sequence star, because stars are divided into two main groups, the main sequence stars that are in their normal life cycle and stars that are outside of their life cycle, stars that are outside of the main sequence stars. Which brings me to the next topic, which is the HR diagram. HR is not a human resource, by the way. It's a Hertzsprung Russell diagram. Who these two guys basically they came up with a plan uh, with a with a diagram to show where the stars are in terms of their life. <clears throat> As I said before, there are two main groups. First of all, there is the main sequence stars like our Sun and like Proxima Centauri and like a lot of stars that happen to be 
going through their normal life cycle. Once they're outside of their life cycle, then they are they are outside of it, and they 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 they, they go through uh, different stages before they they expire, and they basically uh, go into supernova or something like that, like Betelgeuse, for example, which is not a main sequence star. So those are the things that we're going to be talking about. Then we're going to talk about the life cycle of the star, basically how it's going to go around. And uh, so is born, goes through its normal life cycle, life basically span, then goes through stages before it's going to basically go into a supernova or collapse on itself, like what's going to happen to our sun, which is not going to go to a supernova, but rather it's going to be a white dwarf. Some stars are too big to actually uh, become uh, white dwarfs, and uh, one of them is probably uh, going to be a uh, Betelgeuse. And those, they will turn out to black holes. Typical black holes are very small, usually. They are not that big. But there are some big, supermassive black holes that sit in the center of uh, most galaxies, including our own. Our own has a uh, black, super black, super giant, basically, uh, supermassive black hole. And that supermassive black hole is actually called Sagittarius A star. So again, this is our own galaxy. And our own galaxy is just a one in so many other galaxies in our own local local group of galaxies. So our own galaxy is part of other galaxies in our neighborhood. The two closest ones are the so-called Magellanic clouds, the small and the large. But they are actually very, very tiny, relatively speaking, compared to our own galaxy. As a matter of fact, modern studies suggest that these two have collided in the past with the with our own galaxy and actually being attracted to it, and they are being consumed by it. But there are other two galaxies actually the, uh, in our own local group. The biggest of the th of them all is actually Andromeda Galaxy, and then you have Triangulum, which is also another galaxy in our neighborhood, which is big. And uh, at least between our own galaxy and uh, and uh, and uh, Andromeda, they are actually in a collision course right now. And uh, in 2.5, I mean, how is it? Several million, yeah, but five billion years from today, they will actually collide. Okay, they will actually be, they will merge. Actually, some modern study that suggests that the merger has already started because of there is a burst of star formation between them. So actually, the the, the two galaxies are already have started their collision, so that's big so galaxies. Right now, it sits about, about 2.5 million years from us, Andromeda is. And actually, modern studies also suggest that even the Triangulum, another galaxy in our neighborhood, also is coming into collision with the other two. So that's our own local group. Our own local group is just a small portion of a bigger group. And then you see the, our entire, entire <laughs> which is a cluster basically of these local groups. And then you have a super cluster of these clusters. And then, then up to a point where we're talking about the entire observable universe, the universe that we can, no matter how powerful our technology is, that's the max we're going to see. In other words, our universe is actually bigger than the observable universe that we see. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what this thing is. So this is the chapter in... in, in, in uh, in a nutshell. So again, when people in the old days basically looked at the stars, they saw pattern in them, or at least see, they saw objects that are common day objects, and they gave them names. They 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 gave them this this names, the constellations. They gave them specific names like the Big Dipper and the, or so, or so, or some major major in here, or the the. Uh, Orion, which is another famous uh, constellation, you have, uh, what is it, uh, Draco, you have so many other uh, constellations, uh, what is it, Taurus, so many of them, you really don't need to remember their names, and actually, like I said before, the names are really just a reflection of the, uh, of the uh, culture that named them. But uh, the main thing to remember about them is that uh, the, the, that's actually a proof that the Earth is going around the sun because year, year round, as the sun goes around, during the night sky, we see only specific constellations. Until the Earth makes its own rotation 12 months from today, we will see the same constellations in the same places. Planets do not do that. Planets actually hover, hover around, move around uh, continuously. Now, during solar eclipses, when the sun is actually being uh, hid, hidden by the uh, by the uh, by the moon, you can actually see the constellation that you're not supposed to see until six months from today, because the constellation is sitting. It's supposed to only show. Uh, I mean, it's going to be visible during daytime, but during daytime, the sun uh, overwhelms everything in the sky. 
but if it's hidden by the moon, then you can see actually the constellation that you're supposed to see. Let's say, for example, we're in March, we're supposed to see in September or October or something like that, six months from today, or vice versa. Okay, so this is actually uh, uh, what the constellations are. And uh, unfortunately, there is a pseudoscience, which is really not a science at all, uh, astrology. And some people, they send me emails, are you teaching astrology next time? So I don't teach astrology, okay? We teach astronomy. So astrology has to do with psychology, or at least people trying to swing people out of their own money. And anyway, the uh, so this is again about the constellations. One of the main constellations is the one that is very important for you guys to know. Okay, when I was very little, actually, I remember I was taught about it. So let me show you what that is, okay? Let me stop sharing the screen and share with you this screen. No, I didn't share with you. Let me share with you. Where is the screen? This one. Again, I mentioned this software. Do you guys see the software that I'm talking about in here? Do you guys see uh, uh, Stellarium? I want a verbal confirmation because the only way for me to know that you are, because it yes. can go to the. Okay, very good. Thank you. Anyway, this is right now, 8 o'clock, 8.46 a.m. Uh, today is December 1st of the year 2020. And if you look at the bottom in here, it says this is how the sky would look like uh, in Loma Linda, okay, California. And I'm looking at southeast, okay. If you head toward the north, of course, you can't see it right now and you look slightly up in the sky, you will see this objects in here. But right now, like I said, it's 8 o'clock. So if you go outside, you're not going to see anything because of the sun, OK? Unless all of these things that you see are constellations, OK? There is Draco next to Ursa Minor. And uh, where is the other constellation here? Ursa Major is on the, uh, the other side. Where is Cassiopeia, OK? Anyway, so these are some of the main thing in here is this Ursa Major in here. If you Let's turn on the light. If I turn off the light right now, let me come in here and remove this view in here from there here. So this is how the stars would look if really there is a total solar uh, solar eclipse today, okay? but it's not. Or I'm going to change the clock right now and make it very late in the afternoon. I want you to focus on this star in here. Okay, This is the center of the picture right now. So if I continue moving, everything is moving around it, except it, it's not moving, OK? And the reason why it looks like it's moving is because the Earth is spinning, OK? So what we're witnessing in here is actually the rotation of the Earth. This star stays pointing in the same direction, more or less. That is Polaris, no, the northern star, OK? So if you happen to go tonight, you can see what looks like a pan, OK? The top, the tip of the handle of the pen is Polaris. Okay, it's not the brightest star, by the way, by any by any uh, searches of the imagination, because there are far more uh, brighter stars in the sky if they are visible tonight. One of them is Cyrus. Okay, actually, the brightest is Cyrus. Okay, so if I look at it right now, it's what is it? Four o'clock in the evening. It's still. So if I turn out, it's still. You can't see it really. Four forty-eight, just before sunset. Now it's five forty-eight. So I turned I turned back on the the sun right now. So you can see it around almost 6 o'clock, OK? By 5 PM, 5.48, you can see it in there. But the thing with it is everything rotates around it. And what we are looking at, actually, is the rotation of the Earth. The Earth is spinning. That is always in the same location. So it's a good object to know in the sky because that's going to help you know where North is. So if you can find it by finding this four stars that form more or less a rectangle, OK? And they have this weird names in Farkadain. By the way, a lot of these names are Arabic names because they named a lot of the stars. But the, uh, the, 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 uh, then you extend this length further about, what, four times? So you have one, two, three, and four. By the fourth one, by the end of it, that is where Polaris sits, OK? Polaris is here. And it's how far away is it from us, distance? You see distance in here? It's not giving me the position, rising. The distance. It's 432 light years from us. So if you're wondering if this constellation means anything, let's pick up another star in here. So this is 430 light years away from us. 
And this star, where is the distance in here again? Distance is 130 light years away. So this star is actually closer by very, very, very big distance because between 430 and 130, you're looking at 300 light years from us, from between them. So these stars are not in the same neighborhood. So the fact that they are in the same constellation doesn't mean much, okay? So that's one point that I want to you guys to, 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 to understand. Another famous constellation is Orion. I don't know if you guys have seen the movie uh, Men in Black. In one of the scenes, basically, it tells them that the galaxy is on Orion's belt. So let's find Orion in here. So one way of doing it is actually to search for it, okay? I don't, I don't mean Orion. I don't mean the nebula itself. I want the entire constellation. So this is, where is it? Here is. The, the nebula itself, the, uh, the actual uh, constellation itself. Rigel is the Arabic word for basically leg. And then these are the three stars that they talked about. Again, if I look at them, Betelgeuse is the shoulder basically of, uh, of, uh, of Orion. And Betelgeuse is a big star. And right now it's what? The distance is almost 500 light years from us. This three stars, they're Nitaq, and you have also al Nilam, and also you have al Mintaqa, and they are all Arabic words that have to do with the uh, with the uh, with the belt actually itself. But the point I'm trying to say in here is that they are not on the same side. They are not on the same. Uh, the, uh, 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 they are not on the same line like the way they look in the constellation. As a matter of fact, if you look at this one, it's at a distance almost two thousand light years from us. The one in the middle. Versus the other, like this one is 500 light years, and this one is 820 light years, 817 light years. So this is a lot closer, yet this one appears brighter than the other two because it's really a lot brighter than them. The fact that it's very far and appears very bright is because it's a lot brighter. As a matter of fact, is if I zoom on it, you will see that it's not just a single star. Basically, the neighborhood is made up of a lot of stars. Actually, there is here the Orion Nebula in here, which is part of the... Uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the structure in here in the in the nebula in the actual itself the constellation, and then if I get closer, it's far more stars and it gets far more uh, crazy and crazy. So there's this sky in here, this patch of the sky has a lot of stars in it. Okay, so there are more. Here is where the actual uh, here is where the stellar birth is. This is where stars are being born all the time. So if you happen to go to the uh, the uh, Smithsonian, not the Smithsonian, in the uh, Mount Wilson, I don't know if they still do the uh, visits or not, they will show you stars, they will show you this nebula and they will show you exactly how it looks like. This is a very good software actually because it's going to simulate a lot of the things that you do in the uh, actual uh, observatory or actually in the planetarium. Anyway, so let's continue with the... Uh, so hopefully you guys have an understanding, first of all, of how to find this 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 uh, this uh, this star, the northern star, and the fact that uh, the northern star actually is right now in the north, but it changes. Uh, Twelve thousand years ago, it was actually Vega in the in the northern star, and twelve thousand years from today is going to go be, be Vega again because there is a spin of the Earth actually axis, so it's going to rotate. And next time, it's going to point toward Vega. Right now, it's pointing toward the the uh, the uh, the northern star or Polaris. So, and the cycle of this precession actually is about twenty thousand twenty six thousand years. 24, 26,000 years, basically, on average. So uh, every 24 to 25,000 years, 26,000 years is going to spin in the other thing. So that's something that happened in the past and it's going to happen in the future. So if you happen to be that old from today, you know what's going to happen if you're going to be traveling at night. Okay. Again, this is just about the constellations and how they are made. Okay. Again, that's the point I was trying to make in terms of how far they really are, okay? This is a lapse picture of the sky, the same thing I was running earlier, but this is taken with a, with a camera that was basically taking uh, uh, pictures over an extended period of time overlap. This is how it looks like, okay? Same time and tour. So, knowing the names of constellations, they're just much about the stars that comprise them. Of course, that's not true, okay? 
or about the people and the culture that named them? What do you guys think? C. <laughs> C? Is there an option C? What is option C? I'm confused now. I can't see the, the page anymore. Oh, there we go. Does it really tell us if I know the name, for example, anything about the stars? Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So it's B, okay? B. That's the only culture. Okay, very good. Thank you. So... Uh, Again, well, this is one of the basic laws that was basically, uh, we, we actually, we, this is a black body radiation, I think we mentioned it a long time ago, uh, where basically the temperature and the frequency, or at least the peak frequency, is related to the temperature. Object, as it gets hotter and hotter, it's going to emit in different higher and higher temperatures. So when I see a star, and I see its color, okay, meaning its frequency, that's basically the dominant color, uh, the dominant uh, frequency is going to reflect the color of the star. That means I know its temperature. Of course, I really need to do far more spectral analysis to understand really what the temper surface temperature is. But once I have an understanding of the temperature of a star, I know a lot about that star. Just by doing spectral analysis, I know basically so many things about the star. Okay. That's really uh, uh, one of the studies that we do excessively when we look at the stars. Obviously, the blue star is far more uh, hotter, it has higher temperature than a red star. That's exactly the point in here. As a matter of fact, the uh, uh, Proxima Centauri is not is actually towards the dark red. I mean, it's so temperature is not that high at all. Okay. So, which of these stars radiates light? of the longest wavelength. This is a tricky question. That means it's the least frequency. A red star, a yellow star, a blue star, or a violet star. Okay. Remember, shorter wavelength, that means high frequencies. That means high temperatures. So this will be the highest of them all. Violet. Violets will be the highest frequency, the shortest wavelength, not oh. the longest. We're looking okay, for the longest. Yellow. Uh, actually, red is, is less than that. Okay, how about red? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go through all the colors. <laughs> no, red, when you start hitting the object, red is actually the first color that you're going to see in the spectrum. Okay. Red is, uh, is, is longer wavelength smaller frequency and as the temperature rises you're going to get higher and higher frequencies which means the wavelengths become shorter and shorter shorter and shorter okay so this is actually one of the questions that i really need you guys to think about is the the higher the frequency the lower or the shorter the the higher the frequency the shorter the wavelength okay so to go by suggestion of sarah let me type the question how is Temperature, frequency, and wavelength are related. Related for emitting. So an object emitted radiation. The hotter it is, the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. Red is longer than violet. Red is the longest of all the colors that we can see. Okay. Violet is the shortest of all we can see. Yes. Everybody I'm good? Write, I'm writing notes while you talk. <laughs> <laughs> so as the object gets hotter and hotter, this is true also for stars. As the star gets hotter and hotter, it's going to emit shorter wavelength, higher frequencies, 
okay? In terms of colors, red is the longest in terms of wavelength, the least in terms of frequency, the least in terms of temperature. Violet is the highest, at least in terms of the visible spectrum, is the highest in terms of uh, temperature. It's the highest in terms of frequency, and it's the shortest in terms of wavelength. Everybody on board? Am I the only one that can talk? I'm trying to take notes here, people. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I like it when it's live like this one. Other people probably are right now still uh, under the effects of probably uh, Turkey, or maybe they don't want to talk. But I uh, hope that you guys, at least one or two people, have already contributed in uh, the chat session. Can you repeat, but, uh, uh, Red? You said violet is the highest in temperature, highest in frequency, shortest in wavelength. And can you repeat Red again? It's everything opposite to what uh, violet is. <laughs> okay. So it'd be lower in temperature, lower in frequency, and then the highest in wavelength? Longest in wavelength. Wavelength longest, is a length. Longest. Okay. The okay. key word in here is, this is, by the way, this is just for the visible spectrum. So in other words, there are even longer wavelengths than the red, and that is the infrared or the microwave or the radio waves, okay? And there are even shorter wavelengths than the violet. For example, ultraviolet is a lot shorter than violet. X-ray is less uh, shorter than even uh, ultraviolet. And gamma rays are even shorter than these two, okay? So it's just the things we see. I mean, if we're talking about astronomy, and astronomy up to the advent of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, gravity wave basically detectors was only based on uh, the spectrum that we can see or uh, the spectrum that we can see, basically the object we can see initially by the eye. That's basically how astronomy started. People looking at the sky and analyzing what they see with their own eyes and their early spectrometers basically were just based on the visible light. But then people started to discover other ways of basically analyzing waves that are outside of the visible light, namely in the infrared and even radio waves, radio astronomy, like uh, the, the, the big uh, telescope in uh, South America. And then you have uh, now even higher frequencies in the uh, uh, ultraviolet and even sometimes in the X-ray, which is really requires a lot of technology. But that's only spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. So if you turn on, for example, the X-ray emissions, you the sky will look completely different, and the big brightest objects are going to be the neutron stars, not the not the objects like the stars. Okay, because they emit far more radiation in that uh, that uh, that range, and like the sun, which has peaked around yellow. Okay, that's why the sun looks into that co that color for us, and probably we humans on Earth evolved our sensory system in the eyes to see that range, okay? Maybe on a planet like uh, that orbits maybe uh, 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 Proxima Centauri, their eyes are peaked around the red. So they can see the infrared and maybe they can see a little bit of yellow, but they cannot see the blue color at all for them. Maybe you can, <laughs> it looks dark completely to them or even the violet. So that's just a speculation of course, not based on true science, but that's probably what, evolution probably could do to your eyes okay anyway let's continue i hope that everybody is on board for the question not just two or three people okay so again uh we measure the uh, brightness, apparent brightness. There are two kinds of brightness. There is the apparent brightness and there is also the luminosity. Luminosity is the intrinsic value of the actual brightness of a star. Let me go back into the software because it's important in here. When you look at objects in the sky, uh, try to uh, see their brightness. I mean, at least you need you need the something to, to give you that, okay? Okay, let me share. Again, look at, I'm looking at the NIAM right now. One of the things is the magnitude. The magnitude is the, uh, the, the, uh, is basically what it means in terms of the, uh, 
actual brightness, okay, what you see in the sky, okay? But the absolute magnitude is this number. And by the way, the magnitude is actually uh, is, is opposite of what you might think. The higher the number, the less bright the star. So when you're looking at this software or any other software that gives you the, the, the magnitude of star and how bright it is, you have to be careful in here. It doesn't mean that you have a higher brightness, at least higher magnitude, you have a higher brightness. Actually, it's the opposite, okay? So when you're looking at stars, let me look at, uh, for example, Betelgeuse. So this one, the one that we're looking at is a negative 7.2. Intrinsic, okay, the luminosity, but the magnitude is 1.65. So it doesn't look that bright at all in the, in the sky. But Betelgeuse is 0 0.45. That means the Betelgeuse will be a lot brighter than this one, okay? Intrinsically, this is negative 5. And this one, oops, what happened to here? Is negative seven. So this is actually far brighter, far emits far more energy than this one on its own surface. Okay, Riger, for example, negative seven, negative six point nine. So it's less than the one in the middle. So in terms of this stars in here, Bellatrix is in here, also part of the uh, not bright at all, relatively speaking, but it's super bright star. Okay, this is uh, Betelgeuse. Okay. But it's brighter. It's the brightest. It's a lot brighter, for example, than Rigel at night, which is 0.15. This one, sorry, did I say it? It's the other way around. Actually, Rigel is brighter than this one. Rigel is about 862 light years from us. But it's really a bright star, and it's young star, and it's going to go supernova actually too. But this one also a super young star. But it's really actually going through that stage right now. It's through the red giant stage right now. So let's continue with the lecture okay the brightness drops with the distance squared okay so that's because again it's like a light bulb in here or like a, like a candle you put it close from you, it's going to give you visibility better than if you move it further away because the same light is spread now through a big sphere in space and the area of the sphere 4 pi r squared. So that's why the luminosity is the distance squared. So if the sun is moved twice as further from you, your, the luminosity of the sun would look about quarter of what it is. Okay, That's why the stars, when we look at them, they don't look as bright as the sun, although some of them are a lot brighter than the sun but because they are far away. That's the reason, that's the only reason why that is. So again, these two guys, they put this diagram for us. They analyzed a lot of stars and they put them into, let me let me put this one into a bigger view in here. Control, what is it? Oh, I don't want to do that. I was gonna start me from the beginning. View. What is the, uh, no, not view. Slideshow from current. Okay, can I make it even bigger? Okay, so this is a typical HR diagram. There are not only one, there are so many of them, by the way. Okay, so this is the main sequence stars in our sun situation right here. In the x axis is the temperature. Our sun uh, temperature is about 5,700 and something Kelvin. These temperatures are in degrees. Okay, so our sun is right in here, okay? And as you can see, really clearly see, it's a yellow star. Other stars, they appear redder because their surface temperature is a lot less than that of the sun. Other stars, they appear blue, although they're on the main sequence, that they're super hot, okay? So these ones are going to basically expire very soon because they're very big, okay? So, and you can see the luminosity on the x-axis. The luminosity actually is not a linear scale. It's actually a logarithmic scale. I mean, the distance between here and here, it looks like it's the, uh, it's the distance between here and here and the distance between in here and here, they're just twice. It looks like only two times bigger, but actually it's a hundred times bigger, okay? The luminosity between this point and this point, for example, where the sun is, the sun is taken as the starting point for the luminosity. So it looks like one, two, three, four, five, five times the sun looks like it's five times brighter than any star that sits in this point. But that's not true. It's actually 10 
or is it a hundred times, a hundred thousand times bigger, brighter? So that's to give you an idea how big it is. So for example, this is 10 to the power six. It looks like one, two, three, four, five, six times. It looks like it's only six times brighter, but it is not. It's actually uh, one million times brighter. So imagine the temperature that is sitting on these stars in here. Again, uh, the other two stars I mentioned, uh, uh, Proxima uh, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B, are actually not too far from here. One of them is slightly bigger than the sun, and the other one is slightly smaller than the sun. And in this case, actually, these things in here are actually the sizes too. So the radii also are uh, included in here. Now, giant stars, they left this stage. The reason why they are in this stage is because they are burning their, uh, their hydrogen, basically, in the core. Okay. Once they, they, they finish the hydrogen in the core, then they start to go into the hydrogen in the next levels or the helium and through different basically processes that involve even some flashes basically of helium burning where the star becomes so big now because of this rapid nuclear reaction that is happening in its core. So there is tremendous pressure coming from outside. Normally, typically, the star size is balanced between two forces. The pressure coming from the nuclear reaction is trying to push it bigger but the gravity trying to pull is smaller. When these two reach equilibrium, the star sits in here. It's in the main sequence. Once there is too much pressure from inside because there is higher rate of nuclear reactions because the star now has consumed the hydrogen that keeps it in balance, it's going to consume uh, uh, rapidly the, the hydrogen from the other side and then expands, becomes bigger because gravity will not basically over overwhelm that, that pressure from the inside. So now you're looking at giants, and even some of them, they go into super giant. Look at this line. All of these lines are red. Now you have the yellow, and then you have even some super giants that are sitting on the on this side in here with even uh, hotter temperatures, okay? So they are actually around 10,000 Kelvin, okay? And then you have some... After it consumes all of that, a star can go into a supernova or can go into a white dwarf, okay? So white dwarf stars are super hot okay and their temperatures they are all in this range in here some of them are actually start uh, they they start to fade after a long time but at this point all of the stars that we know of they are in this range okay and uh, including for example and i mentioned already uh, Sirius star Sirius star which is the brightest star in the sky is actually made up of two stars one of them is a main sequence star and another one is actually a white dwarf star okay it's it's in this region, super hot one. So it's made up of two. Okay, and actually the second one is typically there is a problem with it because it's slightly bigger than what it should be. So there are new studies now suggest that actually it's a combination of two uh, stars before in the past. Okay, so again, this is the uh, the HR diagram. The main point in here is you have the main sequence stars that are burning their core hydrogen and they are still going through their their normal life cycle. Stars that are smaller, they live a lot longer than stars that are bigger. Stars that are bigger go through the process of consuming that hydrogen far more rapidly than the stars that are uh, smaller in size. These stars can reach billions, I mean, hundreds of billions probably of, life, of age. This ones, they reach about 10 billion uh, years, like the sun is. And this ones can reach only in the millions, sometimes even only less than that of, of, uh, of, uh, of life. So that's basically in a nutshell how the process works in terms of stars. The big ones, they can actually go into a supernova stage. The smaller ones, they cannot go into a supernova stage and they jump and move back into the white dwarf uh, stage. So that's basically how. Can I escape this or what? Okay. Oh, man. How do you escape? Do we, yeah, escape. All right. Okay. Very good. So this is the HR diagram. This is one of them. There are several HR diagrams, and this is at least a picture to give you an idea how stars are basically classified in terms of their age. On the HR diagram, the sun is, you can see, guys, is, that, is the sun a big star or a small star? What do you guys think? Is the sun a big, super big star? 
from the e chart diagram that you saw it? Or is it a small star? Or is it somewhere in between? Yeah, just about them, just somewhere in between the year. So it's an average star, okay? Actually, we use it as a standard. In terms of the number, actually, it's not really, uh, it's not really in between. Uh, the sun is an odd thing. Most of the stars, as I mentioned in the beginning, are actually smaller than the star, uh, than the sun, in terms of their number, their sheer number, only, okay? How are we doing on time? We still have time. Okay, a star that has collapsed to a small size and is cooling off appear in the HR diagram, lower left. Those are the so-called white dwarf, okay? So again, star begins as a nebula from previous stages. And then a protostar due to gravity collapse and forms. Those are basically before it goes nuclear, it is in the protostar uh, basically stage. Then once it has amassed enough mass in it, gravity will be too much and increases its inside temperature. And then the temperature will be so high that nuclear fusion starts to occur in it. At that point, you have reached the, uh, the star stage, which is where most of the stars spend their entire life. They start spend them in that stage, okay? Then after that, it becomes a red giant and ends up as being a white fork. This is typically what's going to happen to the sun, okay? So the sun went through those previous stages. So the nebula that was in our neighborhood where the sun is right now and our planet and everything else, formed from previous uh, stars, including some mm, most likely supernova. Otherwise we cannot explain the presence of the heavier elements on, on earth and any planets on the solar system. Then a protostar formed, okay? And then in the center because of gravity to pulling it together. Conservation of angular momentum dictate that this uh, the objects start to spin. And then as they spin, they gather more material, more material, they heat up the now uh, the conversion of gravitational potential energy into a kinetic energy increases the temperature and more and more mass is mainly hydrogen. Hydrogen is sitting in the core and as this more and more mass comes in, more and more friction, more and more heat up until the temperature reaches at least several million degrees. At that point, hydrogen starts to fuse and in doing so triggers the nuclear reaction and start to expense a little bit, but gravity will keep it in place and the star will go through its main sequence stage, consuming and finishing all of the hydrogen inside its core, then going to the next stages, which is the hydrogen outside of the core, and then actually the helium after that, in doing so, it's going to expand, goes through th several flashes because it's before it collapses on itself and becomes a small, tiny object, shedding the extra materials through a big, basically, a, explosion sometimes it goes through so many uh, stages but then at the end it becomes a white dwarf where it's going to go and cool down and basically lose its temperature of over time so this is how stars are okay now if uh, 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 a white dwarf if it's part of a binary it may go into a uh, uh, consume some of the neighbors basically and so there is very very basically delicate things that sort of could happen with it but it takes so many years basically for it so many eons of years for it to to really lose all of its energy and loses all and basically by the end of that so how do we know all of this for example this is the crab nebula uh, where in the center of it, if you turn off the regular light and look at the uh, the uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, X-ray, for example, emission, you will see uh, there is a tsunami warning in Alaska, not here. Okay. <laughs> anyway, the point being in here is there is a neutron star inside of it. That is, this one was observed in 1054 in the year 1054 by the Chinese and was documented in there. And then later on, uh, further studies basically confirmed that this nebula actually is coming from that observation. So if you do backward calculation into how fast the nebula is expanding, you will find that exactly. So you take pictures. You take a picture, for example, today and wait, for example, five years, 10 years from today, and then take another picture. You see the stars that were in here has moved this far. And you can pull it back 
into the time, this is actually part of a lab that I used to do for my astronomy class, you will see the Crab Nebula and you calculate the time when the, that happened and you will find it coinciding exactly with the documentation that was documented by the Chinese. So uh, that is how we know that a, a supernova can occur. Actually, in the middle of it, there is a neutron star. That is the result of that supernova because the star that caused this one was not a, a, uh, a candidate for black hole formation. So it's not too big, in other words. In terms of sizes, this is the sun. This dots in here, this is where the Earth is. This is everything you know, big and small. The Biden and Trump, they're here on this tiny rock. You and I, everything that we have known from the antiquity, including the Chinese who discovered the Crab Nebula super I mean, uh, explosion, until today, and until in the future, is situated in this little dot in here, as you can see it. And that dot, next to it, there is another dot, that is our moon. And this is about a millionth the size of the sun. So the sun is big compared to the solar system. Obviously, Jupiter is big too, but it's not that big compared to the sun. So this is where our sun is. Vega, which is I uh, mentioned earlier, is part of a uh, uh, it's uh, it's a uh, uh, it's an, uh, another star. It's about two times bigger in terms of mass than the sun. So Vega is big star. So it's even bigger than the sun. So just to give you an idea how objects can be, Arcturus is another which is in the red giant stage. Look at what the sun looks like now, relatively speaking, or Vega for that matter. So this is much, much bigger than that. Alpha Ceti is even bigger than this uh, Arcturus by even larger size. And you keep on looking for higher, bigger and bigger objects until you find Betelgeuse. And I mentioned it several times today, Betelgeuse coming from the Arabic way, uh, word, the uh, Betelgeuse. And I was saying that this is a lot of these names that are actually uh, uh, rooted in there. It's even bigger. Look what the sun is. Actually, uh, there was some concerns in the uh, in the beginning of the year 2020 about it going supernova because there is a change in its luminosity. It dimmed a little and then it came brighter. And now the studies are suggesting that maybe the clouds that have came out of it dimmed the the the, the star. But then initially people thought that maybe it's going to go and basically collapse in itself and go supernova. Uh, there is not much to worry about because it's 500 light years from here. So we're not really too worried that's going to cause a lot of problems on Earth. But just in case, it's 500 light years from here. But it's a big, super giant, basically, star. Okay, And again, uh, this is where the sun is. So if the sun, you can put it in here, it fits so many so many suns, basically. Okay, Even Alpha Ceti is a lot smaller. And even that is not the biggest name in the, uh, in the, uh, in the stars. Okay, I think this was demoted recently. I'm not 100% sure, honestly. It's FEAI. A, but uh, uh, as the biggest star in the so in the in the, the observe in the, the things that we can see, uh, initially uh, when we looked at the stars, I'm not sure honestly, but this is much much bigger. Actually, the sun right now it's not even visible. Vega is hardly visible in here in this picture if you can see it. Okay, and uh, even Betelgeuse is a lot smaller than this uh, hypergiant. Most of the stars that we are looking at and comparing our sun to and studying and even the HR diagram, and all of them actually are in our own galaxy. I think there is one that we were able to identify as big in the Magellanic Cloud, which is about 100,000 uh, uh, light years from the sun, which is from the galaxy actually, which is very far. Because we can't really see individual stars in those galaxies because they are too far. And including this is our neighbor's neighbor. This is the thing that is just sticking to our neighborhood. So most of the stars that we're comparing and we mention and we study and we see in the sky about 2,000 uh, of them, they're actually in our own immediate vicinity in our own galaxy. Okay. So all of these stars are within 30,000 light years from here. So that's the point I'm saying. 30,000 light years, by the way, the galaxy is about 100,000 light years across from edge to edge. And we're sitting about 36,000 years from the, the, the <coughs> excuse me, from the center 
of the uh, of the uh, the galaxy about 20,000 years from the edge of it so we're sitting just about two-thirds of the way so these objects are just 3,000 they're not 30,000 they're only very very close from us they're just in our neighborhood okay like you're looking at the entire United States and comparing people to it but all you're looking at is the people who live in, in, in the, uh, you're, you're in the park and the people only in the park and you're trying to compare sizes and things like that with the people in the park. There are far more people in the United States than the people who are with you in that park on that afternoon. Okay, that's the point I'm trying to say in here. And this is just the galaxy when we're talking about the, uh, the entire universe, okay? Again, black holes it can be remnants of the size of the star is about two and a half times bigger than the sun. Uh, studies suggest that they're going to go into a black hole. Usually, typical those black holes are not going to be big. If the star is even bigger, it's going, they are going to produce even bigger black holes. But there are even some larger black holes that we really don't understand how they could form that sit in the center of galaxies. At this point, there are uh, modern studies suggest probably that the ga gas, instead of going collapsing into a protostar and making a star and going through stages and then making a black hole, no, the gas collapsed immediately into a black hole. So that's really how the study suggests and how the supermassive black holes basically could form. Again, black hole, there is tremendous gravity on it and the gravity increases to a point that nothing can escape it, including light itself, okay? Nothing can escape it, that's why we call it black hole. Again, a huge, a, a galaxy is, uh, 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 hundreds of billions of stars, basically. That's what the galaxy is. And it's an island by itself, like the Milky Way, okay? The Milky Way is an isolated an object in the in the universe by itself, making the, 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 uh, there's so many uh, galaxies, okay? Milky Way, if you go out night in the night and look at it, you see this trace in here, okay? Different cultures basically uh, tells you different stories about it. I remember when I was young, I was told that this is some sort of a trace made by the thieves who stole the hay and all of that nonsense. Again, that's a reflection from the cultures where you happen to have. Uh, but it's really, uh, this is basically, we are inside the galaxy, so we cannot really go outside and see exactly how the galaxy would look like. But uh, studies are, con again, connecting the dots basically in terms of the uh, the luminosity and the distribution of stars and so on and so forth. So the galactic disk that we're looking at is where the main stars are. So you're looking and you see a lot of stars and they give you that, that white uh, region in it. Anywhere above or below that, that is outside of the galactic uh, disk. There is a bulge inside and that bulge, there are some studies now to explain how that bulge could have formed. And that's basically a lot of stars in that area. Now, this is our own galaxy. Our own galaxy extends, especially with the, when you include the halo itself, far bigger than the 100,000 light years I mentioned in the beginning. So it's much, much bigger. It's 100,000 light years from side to side, but from here to here, it's very thin. It's only about 10,000 light years, okay? So it's 10,000 versus 100,000, so it's 10 times long. I mean, uh, so it's like, like a pancake, basically, when you look at a pancake. Most of the material in the pancake is on that disk. So think of the pancake as being 100,000 light years in radius and only 10,000 light years in, in thickness. So that's basically how our own galaxy for is, okay? There are three types, three main types. So Mr. Hubble, when he classified galaxies, he classified them into three main types, elliptical galaxies. And this tend to be old galaxies, okay? After they basically, uh, consume most of their, basically form most of their uh, uh, stars from the material that they have in their intergalactic uh, gases that they have, I mean, inter interstellar gas that it has in the galaxy, then at the end, there is no much formation of stars, the stars tend to be very old, and those are the so-called elliptical uh, galaxies. And then there are spiral galaxies. Spiral galaxies, they're made up of basically what looks like spirals. This is what we believe our galaxy is, and actually modern studies confirm that. And it's usually made up of several arms that are basically of that spiral. 
and most of the spiral galaxies they have actually what looks like it's like a like a bar in the middle okay that's actually what the what the stars form okay so that you know there is no uh, physical thing in there that form that are and then you have irregular galaxies irregular galaxies are usually due to a collision between uh, several galaxies so when they're in that shape we can't really give them the uh, galaxies there are so many galaxies in the at least in the in neighborhood that we can look at okay so these are the two, uh, these are irregular uh, shaped galaxies, the Magellanic clouds, both of them, and uh, large and small. Uh, the point being in here for these two galaxies is the reason why we believe that, if, first of all, they are irregular, we can see that. And the other thing is the reason why probably because they collided in the past and they continue to do so with the with our own galaxy. So they have been basically consumed and their stars, they don't have a lot of stars, by the way, compared to our own galaxy. So they're a lot smaller. So that's why they, 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 they are actually in this, uh, in this irregular shape. So those are our immediate neighbors, okay? And this is a spiral galaxy, okay? This is what we believe our sun is. I mean, our sun, our galaxy is. It's in that same shape. Okay, so galaxies can be active, active into two respects. First of all, in terms of star formations, like starburst galaxies that form stars rapidly. And usually when stars form, they form in the rings and the, in the arms themselves because the gas is compressed due to collisions. So the gas now is compressed and compressed enough so that now those materials get close together and they form stars far more rapidly than our own galaxy, which forms a star per uh, per month, okay? Or, I'm sorry, star per year, okay? So uh, that's basically how uh, 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 a galaxy can be active. Also, there is another type of galaxy activity where, uh, where the actual core of the nucleus of the galaxy where actually the supermassive black hole is feeding or going through stages super active super activity that can emit tremendous amount of, 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 of radiation, which makes it very hard for life to exist, at least not too far from the black hole. As a matter of fact, some of them are super, super active that they can destroy any possibility for life in the entire galaxy or even in some of neighboring galaxies. And we're fortunate enough, at least for our own black hole, that it is not uh, that active. But a few million years ago, it was active, but not with the with the intensity of some of the activity that is seen in other galaxies. So this is something that is known for the for the uh, for uh, for uh, galaxies, and the future probably is going to be active too again. Okay. This is the starburst, basically, where the collisions mix new stars. And the active nuclei, these are bursts of tremendous amount of energy, gamma rays, that can destroy any possibility of, of life in them, okay? Clusters and superclusters. Again, I mentioned the fact that uh, the Milky Way is part of a group in our local group of galaxies. This are all of these things are small galaxies. The two biggest ones are our Milky Way and Andromeda, actually, the Triangulum also is a big galaxy, not to, uh, to uh, not comparable to both uh, these two galaxies, but it's actually big too. Now, the large and the Magellanic cloud and the small Magellanic cloud are actually very close from the uh, from the uh, from our own galaxy. This is now the modern studies are saying the halo of this galaxy and the halo of this galaxy extend very far away from them that now modern studies have suggested that there is star formation between them, suggesting that actually the collision has started. This distance is about 2.5 million years from them, from one another, and they're coming closer and closer to one another. Four billion years from today, five billion years from today, the two black holes in the center will merge and form a new, basically big, probably initially at least going to be an irregular galaxy, but then the it will shape, take its own shape. What happened to the sun during that time? Nothing. First of all, the sun will expire around that time, will uh, go through its final stages around that time, and maybe it would have gone somewhere else. But because the distance between stars and stars is so large that hardly anything will happen, will be noticed by the individual stars, except if you happen to be very close from the, uh, from the, uh, 
center of these galaxies, then stars can be thrown out of the uh, out of the, uh, the region where they are, or consumed by the uh, black holes. So that's basically what's going to happen. We're far away from the center of our own galaxy to worry about that. Yeah, it's going to happen very, very also far in the future that we're not going to probably. Uh, one of you is going to be around. Please let me know. Send me an email because I won't be. Okay. Again, our local group is part of a big local supercluster. So this is our local group, the one I was talking about, 2.5 million years or so on and so forth. But the Virgo, for example, cluster is made up with five. every dot that you're looking at in here is actually a galaxy, not a star. Made up of hundreds of billions of stars. So imagine, this is just our, our, our region, our neighborhood, if you wish, of of. Uh, of of local groups, we're not talking in terms of galaxies anymore. If you want galaxies, this is our local group in here in terms of the, uh, the galaxies. And if you're worried about where the Earth is, where the Sun is, is even a dot you cannot see in here. It's about two thirds of the way from the center of the galaxy. And here, there is no way you're going to talk about the Sun because it's a dot, completely invisible in a dot that is very tiny, hardly seen in this whole picture. But again, you have the Virgo cluster, and you have a redness cluster, which makes a lot more, and you have a lot of clusters. Some of them are actually similar in size to ours, actually bigger than our own cluster, or local group, I'm sorry. And some other groups like this one is the same size, but others are far bigger in terms of their number of galaxies that are in the same group. There is a lot of empty space too, okay? This is... This distance from here to here is 10 million years. So distances from here to here is about 10 times that. It's about 100 million years. Okay. And now, this is a network of superclusters. If you look at this entire thing in here, actually there was an article that came a few weeks ago, I guess, about the the similarities between the uh, this structure and the brain structure. It looks like it's very very awfully similar. So there is a lot of clusters in here, and they seem to be online. They seem to form a web in here. They seem to form uh, similar to the neural web in the brain. Actually, the study was comparing the two, and there is a lot of similarity that is striking to some extent, OK? At least in terms of the numbers and ratios and things like that, and motions and things like that. So if somebody suggested maybe we're living in a big brain. I don't know, OK? So anyway, this distance is 100 million years. So from here to here, you're looking at a trillion, uh, I'm sorry, a billion years, okay? From here to here, you're looking at 10 times. So it's about a billion years, the entire scope in here. So every single dot in here is a galaxy. So when you see like a smash in here, that's, that's so many galaxies that you can only basically look at them as a continuous thing. Our local group, you can hardly see it now. Our own galaxy, you cannot see it at all. So on this stage in here, and that's not the big picture, that's not everything. This is actually the entire observable uni universe. This is 10 billion years. This distance from here to here is about 13 billion years that we can see. And our local supercluster now, we're not talking about even our local group in here or anything like that. We're talking about our, it's a dot in here that has this many dots in it that has this many dots in it, that has this many galaxies in each one of those dots in there. This is our observable universe, yet it's not the big picture. It's not the whole thing, in other words. This is the only thing that we can theoretically see, if we can see it, with our most powerful technology. There is a limitation because the universe is expanding, and it's expanding at a rate higher than even the speed of light. In other words, this galaxy, for example, today we see it come in the future, it's going to fall from our observable universe, it's going to be on the other side that we can't see. In other words, there are galaxies that exist today outside of our observable universe that were observable in the past, but today are uh, basically uh, are on the other side of the observable universe. We're going to talk about the expansion, basically, and the rate of expansion and what causes it. And we see that it's not actually the galaxies are moving away from us, but rather it's the space between them that is stretching. 
That's why they can stretch, the space can stretch with any speed it wants, it can uh, stretch with, including speeds higher than the speed of light. So, uh, early estimates, when Mr. Hubble came up with the study, put the number of galaxies in the observable universe around 100 billion. Each one of these 100 billion galaxies is made up of several 100 billion of stars. So you're looking at this mini, uh, 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 basically observable, uh, uh, so many uh, basically stars in the entire observable universe. But then the study was corrected to put the number around 400 billion galaxies in the observable universe. That's what we can see only. So maybe there is this many actually outside of that. But then new researchers, uh, new research was showing actually the number could be in our only observable universe, looking at a certain dot in the space, in the, in the sky, that is completely dark, and counting those points in there, and collecting that many light from observations that are with the, with the new basically probes outside of the Earth, because of the Earth basically influencing the studies, suggests actually the number is about 2 trillion galaxies. Imagine two trillion galaxies and the actual number is actually bigger than that. So two trillion galaxies, is one of you, for example, decides to count them today? And takes about a second to count each one of them. So if you take, for example, a supercomputer and you program it, here is a picture, count the galaxies on the, and that you can see in the entire observable universe. If one second per galaxy and you're counting them, you're not naming them, you're not getting there, collecting their data, you're not analyzing them, you're not seeing how big they are because it's gonna take you more time than one second. It's gonna take you anywhere from 100 to 150,000 years to complete the counting. So that's a, that's a large number of galaxies. And that is the galaxies, we're not talking about stars. So that is just the galaxies. So this universe is tremendously big and large and the thing that amazes me, and that's really the something that I want you to think about and ponder about, is we are sitting in a dot, in a very small average star, in a very small typical galaxy, in a very small region of that space in a local group, in that very small region of a supercluster in a very tiny, so we are average and average and average, and we're sitting in here and we're talking about all of this. We started in August talking about F equals to MA, and today we're talking about this stuff. Isn't this amazing? How did we know all of this? Thank you, Sherry. We existed human activity, at least modern science, all of this, few hundred years maybe at best. From Hubble when he did his observation, it's less than a hundred years. And yet this thing existed for billions of years and will continue to exist way after we all expire and we know all of this. It was very fun, isn't it? Okay, guys, I'll see you Wednesday. Let me stop the recording first. See you Wednesday, see you Thursday.